Greetings, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me. You are now tuned into the podcast of the R. Kelly Appeal TV, where we discuss topics of the appeal process and going back into the past to bring an understanding to the present moment of what is going on in the uh, history and life of Robert Sylvester Kelly. So we are reading Solace uh, by Jim Derogatis, The Case Against R. Kelly. And we're going to move into part three of the book. Now, I'm critiquing the book. And from what I see in chapter three, a lot of it is where um, it's just a judgment um, upon Robert Sylvester Kelly. Um, chapter three discusses Derogatis' career. He discusses himself. Um I, it's very ironic that Jim Dear Goddess wanted to be a musician and a writer, and he was not able to do this because of the fact that he didn't have what it took. So Robert Sylvester Kelly during this time, R. Kelly is growing. He's um, getting more in the limelight. He's moving from the L platform in Chicago, and he's moving into big areas. He's just won his MGM um, $100,000 award that was, according to Solo Coaster, never even really granted to him. Um, it got lost in the mail. And so now he is, he's made his way. He's pushed his way through stardom. I don't believe people at this particular moment in um, his career wanted him to be that arrogant and egotistical. However, this is Robert Sylvester's style. This is what made him who we love today. So then there was a photocopy of a fax and a highlighted accusation that jumped out. It was a lawsuit during this time um, and it was right at the onset of 2000. So, you know, he had been in the game for a few years, maybe five, six, just getting his feet wet. And then comes this lawsuit. Okay. Now, Tiffany Hawkins in 1997, according to Robert's managers and lawyers, kept everything quiet and Robert paid her $250,000 to drop the lawsuit. Now, mind you, this was going on in Chicago, I believe. They were still kicking it in an area where the girlfriend that um, R. Kelly left at the very end of Solar Coaster. At this point, he would go back to the hotel area and it has had upgraded itself. And so he met with, um, you know, girls there. So let's read it. A lawsuit was filed by a young girl named Tiffany Hawkins in 97. Robert's managers and lawyers kept it all quiet and Robert paid her 250000 to drop the suit. Since then, there's been five or six young girls like Tiffany. So what is the age of these, quote, young girls? Are they legitimately of legal age to consent to have sex with an adult in the state in which they resided? They didn't share that. They, they just put it all together. They clumped the lawsuits and used the term young girls like Tiffany. It seemed unlikely the media never reported a lawsuit filed three years earlier against the major star, but that could be checked. The writer claimed to be sending the letter along with the first few pages of the lawsuit, but nothing else had come through. Pages often went astray at the Sun-Times fax machine. So how do we know that what was was written in one instance didn't, another uh, situation didn't come through the fax machine? I mean, you you notice how you get, you get fax, anyone who works at a, a office, you get a fax, um, it normally comes in like a covered page and then page one, two, and three, but sometimes pages aren't even, um, they're not even calibrated. So you don't know if this belongs to that particular, um, facts or not. So the Chicago police had investigated him, but they never were able to prove anything. Now, this is according to Solis. This is according to Jim Jadir Goddess in his book. Now, someone made the remark and said, 
Well, why are we clout chasing? We know that R. Kelly is guilty. Well, then that person needs to be in prison with R. Kelly because he was there when all this stuff was going down and he said nothing. If you know that much of guilt within the uh, aspects of Robert Sylvester Kelly's sexual life, then you need to be put in prison with him as well. How dare you come onto a platform and say that you know he's guilty? How do you know? How do you even know? So anyway, um, this Tiffany Hawkins in 97, um, there was a, a, God, a, a fact that she was a goddaughter and the person was sharing how her parents were turning a blind eye to what Robert Sylvester was doing with this young woman and <clears throat> that Robert hired a bass player. Um, from Chicago and the police were investigating it and nothing was proven. He shared um, how he wanted to be a musician, this dear goddess guy, but he didn't have what it took. Dear goddess wondered how he could have gotten the critic analysis of Robert Sylvester Kelly during a time when his investigation was going somewhere else. But here's the catch too, in chapter three, if you read the soulless book, is that um, these anonymous letters <laughs> were looked at as truth and proof. And so there was another part in the chapter where he talks about going to take a tour of a a prison with uh, individuals, I think it was um, 60 prisoners were in the um, prison and it was horrific and he wanted to go in and do a column on it. So they said that he could only spend two hours in the prison. Well, he went in and then, you know, did his tour, came out and before you know it, there was another call and that there was a riot at the hotel at, or at the prison. Well, here's the catch with that. Why would he even put that in the book at that particular moment? I believe he was trying to decide where he was going to say that this facts came from. Was it from prison? Was it from someone who was incarcerated and possibly wrote the facts and sent it to him? And now the riot happened and now they're gone. Well, why would you even suspect that, dear goddess? Why would you even say that this could have happened from an inmate that was um, that was there? Um, let me see. I later learned that what prisoners considered a protest, but the warden called a riot, started when jailers delivered a court order allowing a 28 year old inmate to attend his mother's funeral seven hours after the service ended prepare for what they called the goon squad which they knew would rush in with platoons swinging the prisoners wrapped themselves in mattresses according to protocol the rapid response team should have been armed with nice sticks and shotguns but somebody brought a real weapon round okay and uh, he fired from a distance of six feet at the prisoner he encountered, aiming at them only in the men who were left exposed. Um, <clears throat> he ran back to the newsroom, there a goddess, and within one week, he looked at the victims, talked about the disturbances, and he investigated more. So then he starts to talk about his mother being an, a vicarious reader, which was the opposite of R. Kelly. You see that. And that she loved writing. And his father was a um, underwriter for an insurance company. I don't know how that plays into Solis. But anyway, he's going on. He had no career guidance. Um, he was a boring reporter, dear goddess. He talks about the conditions um, of the prison, and that was his major breakthrough until Robert Sylvester Kelly's came, case came forward. So then he wrote a letter that how ironic the, case, the jail would be closed. He said his twin passion was music and writing. 
um, as a youth. Dear Goddess then discusses his college career. Not sure how it relates to R. Kelly, but okay. Talking about all the industry, his music genres, Dear Goddess talked about his senior year in high school and all this other stuff, okay? But on page 49, he admits continually stalking R. Kelly. So let's go to page 49. And I know this is kind of boring because <laughs> it was boring to me. Um, 49. Through the mid-90s, I continued to follow R. Kelly's career with the pride of a hometown town journalist and critic who'd been there almost at the start as well. I'll admit, a fan, albeit one with reservations. Hmm. Jive Records released the singer's third album. I didn't quite know what to make a download. Nobody has to know and still don't, despite the title, which became better known as slang for sex between an ostentatious straight man and another man. Kelly's song is an account of sleeping with another man's wife and urging her to keep it a secret. It's just plain weird, especially when the husband, voiced by Ronald Isley, croons in his celebrated falsetto. How could you go so low? But I concluded that Kelly had evolved, reaching out to Brothers in the Ghetto Inn as I look into my life to follow his example to love and respect that woman and bring her happiness. So now what he's doing is he's judging um, the, the writing styles of what is happening and how it's going down. Um, and then down low, he's trying to portray one or two items. One, that there could be some type of uh, sexual um, situation with a man and R. Kelly or with the woman and he's cheating on his wife. Well, see, these are things that was projected and, and we as as fans and supporters of Robert Sylvester Kelly have a right to determine how we see his music, okay? We see it the way we live, okay? And I believe that if he saw this as clear and evasive as he's trying to put in the book, then maybe he was on the down low. Maybe he saw it that way because you could see it either or, okay? So I believe R. R. Kelly at this point was just bringing sexual connotations to the surface and opening up ideas of what was really going on in the world because that's what R. Kelly did with his music. He connected it to real life situations and scenarios that was going on. In the months following R. Kelly's album, the singer talked a lot about finding God. So now he's he's searching where to go with R. Kelly because now he's talking about, you know, sexual situations and then now he's bringing God in the situation. So he let that be known as he's following him that um, their goddess was confused because he's like, how do you go from bump and grind to I believe I can fly to um, trading my life and all of these other things. So R. Kelly was just swooping in and whooping, you know, he was hooping. He was hooping in the music industry and they didn't know how to follow him. So beneath this, the stage went, okay, so he gives a rendition of the um, miraculous um, stage performance where a woman comes on to the stage, strips and bra and panties in a, a bed with Kelly and Kelly gets into the bed with her. The bed drops down and then you don't see anything. And then the lights turn dark. And he also uses the statement that there was no encore after that took place. So <laughs> he watched R. Kelly 365 days later as a journalist surrounding the R. Kelly situation and the lawsuit. So that was one of his biggest heights in chapter three, but he still does not share that this case with this Tiffany lady was um, warranted. Nothing ever came of it. And this is my theory. Why would someone choose to participate 
in a, a lawsuit, get paid. And then during this whole process, never bring it up again. That would be money in the bank for the entire lifetime of me. If I wanted to come back and this lawsuit states that I can't do it, I can't talk about it, I'll pay you. What happens if I do talk about it? <laughs> I mean, what? Do I have to give the money back? Or can I really tell my story? Can I really, really, really tell my story? Because if you think about it in the docuseries, this woman's story came back up when she was told at the lawsuit, supposedly many years prior, you cannot talk about this. They, this, this dear goddess guy went as far as going to Robert's old place where he lived and was just talking to the neighbors, like reeking for something. Normally when something comes out, when something comes to the surface, it comes to you. You don't have to go seek it. It just shows up. And you're like putting the pieces together and you're like, oh my goodness. Oh, this is why this is here. This is why that is here. Okay. So dear goddess even says in this chapter that uh, he didn't know if it came from a person from prison or an old church lady because of how nice the statement was. And the facts that said, I just want him to get help so he will stop hurting people. Hmm. So now school ain't going to make you a millionaire. Chapter four in this chapter, he's talking about um, the paychecks. He's talking about looking to find what was going on in the lawsuits. So him and this dude, they go take off on a journey to pursue um, the lawsuit claimed. So the lawsuit claimed Kelly had a propensity to have sexual contact with minors and that he began a relationship with Tiffany in 91 when she was 15 and he was 24. She became, she became a frequent presence at CRC earning $300 in cash from Kelly when she sang backing vocals on Born in the 90s and a $1,500 check from Barry Hankerson when she performed as a backup rap rapper on Aaliyah's AJ None But a Number. Now, in addition to the allegations of underage sex, the lawsuit charged sexual harassment in the workplace since Kelly had employed Tiffany in the studio. In a subsequent motion deeper in the stack of papers, Kelly's attorneys argued that such allegations must, fi must first be aired before the Illinois Department of Human Rights and Tiffany's attorney dropped that claim. So do you see what's going on? Tiffany also frequently visited Kelly at home, according to her lawsuit. The first apartment he bought was on the 15th floor of um, Park Plaza in Wabash, a building he lived in before. Back when it was the YMCA hotel, the landlord ne uh, neon sign atop the building had been replaced in a colorless language. The story is that the claim that Tiffany was in a recording studio whenever she didn't want to have sex, he would throw her out and that she agreed to some of the acts he demanded in the studio and at his home include threesomes with other underage girls. The suit had claimed she traveled and had sexual contact with Kelly on his tour bus in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Indiana, and Washington, D.C. They also stated that the age of consent varied from state to state, and so does the statute of limitations. Illinois prohibits adult men from having sex with girl, girls under 17, but prosecution for statutory rape must be brought within three years. The statute for criminal charges had not expired when Tiffany filed her lawsuit in 96, but the state's attorney in Illinois generally avoided these cases because of the dif difficulty of proving them when it came down to he said, she said. So this is why in 2008 he ends up getting free because all of these allegations were all false. They they were false. You had these women being in uh, relationships with him, whether professional, whether employed by him, and it's his word against her word. Whether in a relationship, but in different states, 
the age varies. Okay, the office had pursued one such prosecution six years earlier. However, in that case, it would be reflect to intertwine with Kelly's life in important ways. In 94, a grand jury indicted this guy for sexual assault, not R. Kelly, but this other guy with sexual assault in relationship with a 16-year-old volunteer during his campaign for Congress. So Reynolds was convinced, convicted in 95 and sentenced to five years in prison. He resigned from the House in disgrace, but the state drew harsh criticism for how the case was handled. During the trial, the victim re recanted her grand jury testimony, cited her Fifth Amendment right not to incriminate herself, and refused to answer questions on the stand. The judge held her in contempt of court and jailed her. See, so sometimes you say stuff and then you don't remember because you will never remember a lie when you are in a stressful emotional situation that is being recorded and viewed because there's going to be some things that you're going to stumble across. So the sexual contact between Tiffany and Kelly continued for almost three years, according to the lawsuit, ending four months before her 18th birthday in 94. The lawsuit didn't say why it ended, but claimed Tiffany was devastated. And two months later, she attempted suicide and spent time in the hospital, naming as co-defendants Kelly Jive Records and Hankerson's management company, Black Enterprise, Tiffany sought $10 million in damages. Her filings included a list of two witnesses who, presum who presumably will testify or had already promised to do so among them, Aaliyah, Barry Hankerson, Wayne Williams, members of Public Announcement, staffers at CRC, and Robert's half-brother, Kerry. Why the hell has none of this been reported, I asked, when we came up for air. Abdon says that the competing reports who regularly checked the bin of legal files at the Dell Center were white and they might not have recognized the name Robert Sylvester Kelly or even know who R. Kelly was. Now, this comes back to the statement that these were black women and nobody cares about the voice of black women. Well, black women should care about their own voices. Nobody is here to save you. There is no one coming back to save you. Any of us, we must do it for ourselves, you know, and this is the, the anger that comes from the whole Me Too movement and this, you know, black girls cry when <laughs> we've been black forever. So why would we not stand up for our rights knowing and seeing? Because I know, I guarantee you, we've heard of another sexual harassment case and lawsuit that happened um, within our own personal lives as black women. So being responsible, being respectful and not being emotional after we've been played. We have to be stronger than that. We have to be, we have to teach our women today to be more mature than that. So anyway, they go through these publications and then they get phone calls about the claim and then there's confidentiality agreements that says they can't discuss it and this is when they go out and start scouting the neighbors from R. Kelly in his old home hometown. So I just, you know, chapter three and four to me, <sighs> continues to be a dead end. Every time they go and try to find and figure something out, it's a dead end. Why is it a dead end? Because even in 1994, we thought we hit another dead end until the source provided a copy of a document signed by Leah and her parents, Michael, and less than a month after the marriage between the two of them and the agreement stipulated that in consideration of payment of $100 by Kelly to Aaliyah, $100 payment of $100 by Kelly to Aaliyah. Two sources later told me that the amount Kelly actually paid off was $3 million. The two would serve all personal and professional contact. Like they would sever so, so they wouldn't have any type of public um, relationship due to the nature of the music industry and this uh, ability to engender rumors, personal information, both true and untrue. 
In the agreement, Kelly admitted no liability or wrongdoing and Aaliyah and her parents discharged him from any future legal claims due to a decline in her ability, reputation, or marketability. Emotional distress caused by any aspect of her business with Robert or physical injury or emotional pain from the assault or battery perpetrated by Robert against her person, Hankerson, an attorney for Kelly, Arnold Reed were named as, a, as monitors to assure the two complied with the terms of the agreement. So we're getting ready to move into Aaliyah and then Re Aaliyah releases her first album in 1996. I believe that had a lot to do with the control mechanisms of Aaliyah going out on her own. And I believe, I don't believe that the actual case itself had to do with um, exploitation of a minor more than it had to do with the minor's rights to her music. And I believe um, that if that weren't the case, she wouldn't have came out right after with her own title, her own debut, Aaliyah. So that could have got misconstrued into um, being sexual with the minor because she was underage. And yes, he had to relinquish himself from all of her rights. And I believe that that's where that came from. And people took that lawsuit and made it a sexual thing. I, I can really see that. So this right here, <laughs> Solace is again, a mind boggling book that makes me wonder, was this man following R. Kelly to bring him down because he couldn't be who R. Kelly was, he couldn't do the things that he did. And I'm not making judgment or passing any type of, you know, um, guilt or innocence on anything. I'm because I wasn't there. And like I told one of my um, commenters, you know, you need to be imprisoned as well. If you think for one, one iota of a moment that you feel he's not guilty and how can we, or you feel he's guilty when um, we are cloud chasers because we believe that he is innocent. Well, here's my thing to you. As I said on the comment, you need to be incarcerated and serving time with him because if you know he's 100% guilty for all the things that they're saying he's done, you must have been there. So maybe you were the one taking the videos. I don't know. Um, but again, I thank you for liking, commenting, and subscribing to this channel. We are moving forward. May 4th is coming up very soon. Um, something may break prior to that. But I will definitely keep you posted as I hear things and as I do my research. Um, <clears throat> I do have a reliable source that keeps me posted on a lot of the uh, areas of the appeal. So, yeah, what are your views? What are your views on this topic right here? And um, as always, keep it 100 and we'll see you next time.